communication is the most important thing. I am very clear with everybody. It's like, I don't know if we should do this. I'm like, if you feel a change, it's worth trying out because right. at the end of the day, you need to love this record and I'm going to be done with it and maybe I'll listen to it ever again or I may listen to it every three weeks for the rest of my life. But I need the customer to know that they're getting what they want and to be able to get it. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. Today's episode of Recording Studio Rockstars is sponsored by Roswell Pro Audio, maker of handcrafted microphones in California. Inspired design and impeccable attention to detail will help you capture a gorgeous vintage sound without the vintage price tag. Check out their beautiful line of microphones at roswellproaudio.com. Hey, Rockstars, it's your host, Lid Sean. Welcome back to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Dan Scheich, a multi-Grammy-nominated mastering engineer and owner of Tone and Volume Mastering here in Nashville, Tennessee. Dan went to school for recording at Middle Tennessee State University, also my alma mater, after which he was told that there was a career that provided a legitimate excuse to buy and listen to speakers for himself that were otherwise irrational purchases. And that career was called the music business, right? After graduating from MTSU, he worked as a staff engineer at MCA Music Publishing, now Ronnie's Place, and following that, Soundsage Studios for some number of years that he doesn't recall because he didn't sleep much then. Next, he was an independent engineer and a longtime assistant for F. Reed Shippen. And in 2001, he stepped out on his own to start tone and volume mastering. Also, Rockstars, make sure you check out um, Reed Shippen's podcast interview with me. I've forgotten the number, but it's a, it's a few back. If you search for it, you'll find it. Over the past 18 years, Dan has mastered for artists such as Johnny Lang, ASG, Third Eye Blind, Cody Jinx, Shannon Sanders, Big Daddy Weave. Marvin Sapp, Secondhand Serenade, and Chris Jansen. He's worked on almost every genre of music. He's got a gold record for Francesca Battistelli's album, My Paper Heart, and has had recent Grammy nominations for William Murphy's gospel album, Demonstrate, and the alias chamber ensembles, Amorism's Music of Paul Moravec. He also occasionally tweaks studio monitors, setups for engineers in need. That's cool, man. We'll have to talk about that a little bit. Please welcome Dan Scheich to Recording Studio Rockstars. Dan, are you ready to rock, dude? I'm ready to rock. Awesome. Glad to have you here. I know we're in an all we're we're in the studio, but we're in what I like to refer to as Studio B for me, which is up in the dining room. Hey, I got a beautiful view of a tree behind you, so it's cool. Nice, man. That's the cherry tree right oh, there. Nice. Um, yeah, my studio is uh, going under some renovations right now, getting the floor replaced due to some um, neighborly flooding. I'll leave it at that. Neighborly and, uh, flooding. That's yeah. the first time I've heard that phrase ever used. So, uh, yeah, but um, but luckily the neighbors were kind enough to uh, to uh, go in and fix the floor as well. So doing some fixing, but we're up here in the house. You know, I've kind of read your intro to you, but tell us more about how you got into this. So I, I think you were at MTSU after I was, of course, Reed Chippen was a classmate of mine. We were in the same classes back then. Yeah, he was a year or two ahead of me. So, yeah, pretty close. I uh, went to school in Evansville, Indiana at the University of Evansville for a couple of years where I thought I was going to major in physics and get into speaker design. Nice. And Did uh, they have a good acoustics program there? Oh, I have no idea. I spent my two years in general education trying to figure out what I was going to do. So the impetus to leave was was pretty easy once I heard about the recording business. Before that, uh, I had an older brother who I shared a bedroom with, and he had a really great music collection. And he started getting me into cool stuff like uh, the Bee Gees and the Jay Giles Band and the Eagles and uh, Joan Jett and the Blackhearts. The Eagles Uh, and Bee Gees, two bands we were just talking about down in the studio, right? (laughs) Um, Yeah, so I was listening to really cool stuff when I was six years old, and I went from, from disco duck to actual disco. Nice. <laughs> Disco duck. What was the, um, 
who did the poem that was like, you know, I'd rather be fried in Crisco than listen to goddamn disco. Was that <laughs> Shel Silverstein or something? I do not I know. I remember that as a kid at, in grade school and like some kids were cool enough to choose that as their poetry to recite from the stage. <laughs> of course, like, you know, what are your feelings now? I mean, I, I'm sort of a fan of just about every style of music and definitely would be a fan of disco as well. Oh, right? yeah. I love it. I listened to the Bee Gees recently. You know, a four on the floor with a funky groove it just makes my my head shake and makes me happy. Um, off the top of your head, what's a style of music that you totally didn't like, but now you dig it? Uh, old fashioned country. Old fashioned country. Nice. Yeah. When I when I uh, when I came up, I was zero amount of country anything. Uh, I wasn't exposed to it. I didn't like it. I listened to heavy metal and hip hop. Nice. And uh, I came down here and started working on... Limp Biscuit was your jam? No, sir. It was <laughs> not. Pantera was my jam. Okay. Um, so I uh, came down here and started working on some of this stuff and uh, kind of had a bit of a revelation working on a Whitey... Mo- I think it was a Whitey Morgan in the 78s record. Uh, when I heard... And, and before I liked the Highwaymen and stuff like that on occasion, but those were always in passing and I never really sat and listened to it deeply. Yeah, And with this Whitey Morgan record, I heard where there was a place for every little step out, a little steel step out, a little telly step out, a different solo for this. And it just went, you know, the light bulb over my head came on. I said, oh, there's a lot of really quality stuff here. Interesting melodies and with good drummers and good sounds and a cool singer. Like, I I got interested. Um, Were you, and you were probably... Part of the tracking stage of that? Oh, uh, no, that was or? something I was just mastering a few years ago. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, great. Cool. Yeah, that was probably four years ago. I love it, man. Yeah. Um, you know, for me, it was probably an exposure to that kind of stuff here in Nashville through the tracking stage and just witnessing great musicians get together to play. And, you know, the first time you see musicians be that um, and the arrangement and, and the production be that uh, – aware of the song structure such that like, you know, the fiddle part just comes in Mm -hmm. in between the vocals. And unlike my fiddle playing when I was in a band where I thought I was just supposed to keep playing the melody over and over and over again. (laughs) You're the rhythm (laughs) fiddle player. Yeah. So that's cool. Um, I didn't, I didn't really see that in the session work that I was doing when I was at MCA and soundstage, I was so keyed at uh, making sure everything worked and looking for the next thing that needed to be covered. I wasn't listening deeply into the music. I was off to the side checking patches or, you know, doing whatever needed to be done to get the session on. It wasn't the deep listening that came on until much later. And I didn't work on that much country music. Well, I did at MCA a lot, but at Soundstage, I worked on, you know, whoever came in and it wasn't always country. And there were a couple of guys that got called there for the big country stuff. So I just didn't see it. So tell us about Soundstage. I believe I've been there and I remember it as like a multi-level studio or something like that. A bunch of studios, wasn't it? Oh yeah. Um, I was there in 98 or 99 ish. Um, before, yeah, around the year 2000. And, uh, it was a, I think it had three rooms downstairs at the time. And then they had a studio upstairs that somebody else owned. Maybe they had a couple of rooms. And then the final stage mastering was up there with Randy. And then shortly after I left, 10 inch records came in and and put in a studio there. So they moved around a lot and I'm sure it's moved a lot since then. I don't know who's there now. I was in, uh, I was in the studio last year for a JBL event and backstage was nothing I even recognized anymore. Yeah. And everything had been redone and was really, really nice. Um, so when you were at school at MTSU, you were doing the the um, maintenance lab, mm-hmm. right? So you were learning how to fix stuff and wire stuff and do all that. Yeah, I was. I, was, I, I, I think I took that class, but I never worked in the lab. I kind of wish I had. Yeah, I took the class and I got along with uh, Alton and Dale really well and uh, really w- was very interested in finding out a little more about how things worked. They had us recapping consoles and... Uh, at one point, we recapped the Neotech that was in the Studio C room. Yeah. And I got the job of going in and reinstalling all the modules and calling them up. So I got to go and sit there with these boxers, the speakers, not my pants, and uh, listen to whatever I wanted, however I wanted to, while just dialing everything in, like just to one little DB on that group bus or whatever. And the way those worked, you had to pull one module out, 
to get to the tweak on the module next to it and then put that module back in and like keep pulling one out to get to the tweaky spot. So I, I bent over and broke my back on that stupid thing for hours and hours and hours, but nice. that it was, was, it was it's, yeah, the Neotech elite. And, uh, it, but it was great to get turned loose in there, you know, cause sometimes you can do other stuff when you're done yeah. with your tweaking. Yeah. So you, you talked about, um, having access to the studios and getting in there a bunch and, and stuff. And I feel like, um, uh, F Reed also had a lot of the same things to say mm -hmm. about spending his maximum time in the studios at school. Um, yeah, there's a time where you get to be known as the guy who's around fixing stuff. So if somebody has a problem, Dan, come over here and help us. So you yeah. go in, figure out a problem, you know, work something out, meet some more people. So that's what I wanted to ask you. What do you feel like some of your takeaways from going the extra mile to learning how to fix things and how things work in the studio when you were coming up and learning this stuff? Well, I don't really feel like that was the extra mile. That was just what I was interested in. So, I mean, I didn't really do anything else. I didn't play anything. I wasn't in a band. I was interested in what stuff sounded like and how to make this thing do that however we need it to. And what happens if I put this mic over there? I think that's cool. You know, I remember being struck by that when I was at school. I think Jamie Tate was the first person to tell me that, that he didn't play an instrument and wasn't a musician first. And I was like, really? You're doing this and, and you weren't a musician first, you know? And then, yeah. and then I discovered that like, there are all these great people making records that, you know, aren't a frustrated musician like myself. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but so, you know, and that, that probably started for you in just the listening stage, just coming up, listening to music and getting fascinated by it. And yeah, I was moving around my bedroom and setting up speakers. Like I started pushing lawnmowers when I was 10 to buy nice. speakers. And my brother, of course, had some big speakers. And I would notice that in the doorway, there was a bass, but in the middle of the room, the bass was gone. And like bass is the coolest sound there is. So I'm like, why does, why is that not like that? So I'd move the speaker and the dead spot would move. So I was, you know figuring out room acoustics by accident. And uh, then I borrowed, a, from a different brother, I borrowed a huge pair of these Serwin Vega speakers that were just absurd, 15-inch woofers. I blew one up with Eye of the Beholder from Metallica. Nice. Um, you have to work to blow up a 15-inch Serwin Vega woofer. I was very proud. Um, but uh, I had an equalizer that had a little real-time analyzer with a mic input. I didn't know what I was doing, but I pulled apart a pair of headphones because I knew that they could work backwards and plugged them into that and was doing little RTA tuning of my crappy speakers in my, you know, 10 by 11 bedroom, trying to like make it just the most balanced they could be at my little spot. And it was great. And it was so satisfying. That's pretty cool, man. Yeah. I like the fact that when you're um, at that age in life and, you know, it's like you're sort of fearless about doing it, you just will do it. You know, now that I've got a studio and I'm in the middle of something, I'd be terrified to even move my speakers. Mm -hmm. But um, I definitely want to talk to you more about that. I mean, maybe we should just jump into some some questions around that. For the rock stars listening, what's some what's some basic understanding of what it means to have dead spots and why the bass is different in a different place, and you know what they should understand about speaker placement. You know, any any core teaching you want to share about that? Um, symmetry is always good. Um, having your first reflection points, it, it varies depending on whether we're talking about bass, uh, smoothness or, you know, imagery, imaging, not imagery, imaging in the mid range and your high end balance. So you want to have your first reflections absorbed. So your mids and tweeters aren't bouncing stuff that cause comb filtering back right. in your spot. And, and that's, that's easy what's to do. The, what's sort of the generally the considered the cutoff frequency, basically, uh, there's a frequency below which you're, you're considered to be talking about low end and room modes and above which you're talking about reflections off the walls and stuff and first reflections, right? Yeah. It's kind of a sliding scale. It gets the lower in frequency that you go, the more it's about room modes and not just bouncing off the walls. Um, you know, below 200 Hertz or 300 Hertz, it's a lot of speaker placement and rear wall reflection. And that varies depending on your room size, bigger rooms have less of that. And they're spread out to lower frequencies. So smaller rooms are going to have more of that at lower frequencies. Like an eight-foot ceiling usually has something horrible happening at 70 hertz. And love, if it's a, love it. I've got an eight-foot ceiling in the studio, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> yeah. And if you've got a nine-foot or a, a nine-foot wide wall, it almost doubles up. So you get a complicated little thing of of spikes and dips. And you can treat for that and you can move in and out for that, or you can lean back. 
you know, sometimes there's one little spot in my room right now where there's a little bit of a dip and I know that's where the dip is. So when I think I'm hearing the dip, I lean back two feet. Go, oh, okay, there it is. That's right. And that's just part of living in, you know, a studio that isn't completely dialed with gobs and gobs of, uh, you know, bass traps and acoustic treatments. Right. Totally. If I walk out of the control room through the little kitchen and I stand on in the bathroom with the door open in the studio, the bathroom floor is elevated and it's just like this. I don't, I'm not sure exactly what frequency is. I think it's pretty low, but it just feels like this sub bass trap right there. And you can really hear if there's mm-hmm. like something crazy going on with your kick drum. Yeah. And you got some little resonance in your floor joist or something that just yeah. find that one and look, I love that. And then they bounce. Yeah, exactly. And then, you know, I always like to go on the back wall and just put my hand on it to mm-hmm. feel the low end. Um, or put my hand on the console in front of me if I want to feel a little more of the energy too. Yeah, that's an interesting thing. Some people like a floated floor to feel the movement and what it does to the room. And lots of people like a very solid floor so they don't feel any of that. And it's all ears. And, you know, I'm of the school of if you like it, you like it. And if your work is good, who cares? So if it's a floated floor, you might feel the movement in your feet more? Well, not floated because that I think that assumes you've got uh, absorption technology going on. I'm talking yeah. about just you know regular residential joists, right? Where it's not uh, linked to the concrete or the ground or somehow, and it's just free to resonate a little bit. Yeah. When uh, we worked at Recording Arts in uh, downtown, they had a crawl space on their floor or under the floor, but when you lit it up and it shook the floor, it was kind of satisfying. And, you know, some like you go to some really nice mastering rooms or control rooms where the floor is solid, it doesn't do that. And sometimes kind of like, hmm, maybe I wish this was shaking the room a little bit. Yeah. Well, I definitely think that music is about the enjoyment of it. Mm-hmm. And I've been thinking about that a lot recently when I think of how many formats we're trying to decide we're making music for. We've got like, I've got an iPhone with a speaker on it. I've got car stereo that that's probably like Bluetooth streaming from my iPhone. I still have a CD player in my car. Mm -hmm. You know, we have streaming websites. We have a CD that you play. We have our studio monitors playing directly off of a, you know, a converter. Um, You've got earbuds. There's just so many different options. And I guess, um, you know, maybe, maybe we can talk about that a bit too. But, you know, are we really trying to make music for all those things at once? Or do we find that we we ultimately have to sort of lean towards a favorite and try and optimize what we're doing for the thing that we like the most? I feel like a well-balanced production doesn't need to favor one over the other. Like, I don't do stuff thinking I'm doing this for headphones and this for laptop speakers and this for a phone. Everybody's going to listen wherever they want to listen. And a well-done production is going to sound good on all of those. And it's not going to have so much low end that it blows up your phone, but it'll have enough where it sounds full-ish, you know, as much as it can (laughs) on a phone. And really, phone speakers have come a long way in the last 10 years. True. You know, there are times where I scroll across something and can enjoy listening to it. If I don't want to get up and go fire up all the stuff or switch an input to this and that, I'm like, oh, well, this is cool. And then I'll make a note and come back to it later to listen on the big guys. But, you know, people listen there, so it's good to know when stuff translates, but I don't do it just for that. Right, right. Um, All right, well, so, you know, I like to start off the podcast asking guests to share an inspirational quote. I wonder if you got anything to get us fired up about hitting the studio. Man, I don't know if it's inspirational, but it's one that keeps coming back. And uh, I think Dave Collins said it, and it's that the music business is a a 10-month-a-year operation. You just don't know which 10 months it is. (laughs) <laughs> nice. And uh, it, it may be more of a, a solace thing because, you know, everybody has a slow week here and there. And right after we moved into my house, and which where my studio is now, uh, I had a slow month. And that really sucked because we just spent all of our money yeah. and had a slow month. And I'm like, God, is my career over? Am I going to lose this? Blah, blah, blah. Well, of course not. I'd been doing it for 12 years at the time. Nothing ever went away. Yeah. It all showed it back up. Everything was fine. And hearing, you know, other people say that and having, hearing other ex, uh, experiences similar to that at the time, I wasn't terribly social. So I didn't talk to people about stuff like that so much, but you know, time keeps passing and work keeps showing up. And now when there's a quiet minute, like whew, I get to go walk the dogs or exercise a little more. And, or maybe we can reinstall all that uh, Mac OS. 
Oh, good God. <laughs> I'm going through that right now. Um, yeah, all right. I'll talk about it for just a sec. We were just talking about it before this, but uh, I'm, I'm reinstalling the operating system on my Mac. Uh, I had upgraded my, my studio computer, and then I, I went ahead and tried to move up to high Sierra. Sierra. I mean, you know, that'll be a dated term a year or two from now when somebody listens right. to this, but right now it's relevant. <laughs> And um, and then uh, you know it went a, a notch too far, and so then my Pro Tools wasn't liking that. So I'm like, gosh, I got to go back, you know, backtrack. And I was I had had a pretty bad um, lack of a backup a couple of years ago or something like that. And so I finally got a new system going where I'm using a time machine. Yeah, drive. Nothing learns you like getting burned once. Right, exactly. I got burned on my backup, and so I was like, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna try Time Machine as an easy solution, and it's kind of cool this time. I was able to back up to before I installed this stuff yesterday by just going into the time machine and saying restore and it just it just pulled it all back up. So that's kind of cool. So that's yeah. that's my little tip for the day yeah. is uh, check out Time Machine. Yeah, that's great. I don't miss Pro Tools at all. <laughs> <laughs> so talk, let's talk about that. What are you using when you're making music? I use Sequoia. Isn't that a tall tree on the West Coast somewhere in the north? It is. It's also a Toyota. Um, but yeah, it's made by Magic's the people that make Samplitude, okay. it's a, a more full-featured, has a few mastering features, but it's a multi-track DAW, similar to Samplitude or Pro Tools. I mean, I, I learned how to use the DAW in Pro Tools, and I liked the editing style, and I liked having multiple tracks to drop stuff to if I want to do an edit or a crossfade or if I need to add a little bit of crowd or if I need to add a reverb tail to something, I can grab a little moment of something, fire the reverb, on its own track and just let it trail off. So just for clarity's sake, rock stars, Dan, you're mastering yeah. all the time now. Mm -hmm. So right. Okay, cool. Yeah. So this is we're talking about the mastering process, having this flexibility to get a little ninja with with things yeah. by using multiple tracks and stuff. Yeah. Uh, what I had used before that was a combination of uh Nuendo and Waveburner Pro, which I, I think I got Sequoia. 14 years ago so i've been out of that for a while but i, I used to use wave burner yeah. pro too and it had the two little tracks things so you could do a crossfade but you couldn't play three pairs at a time right so if i needed to do something frisky i had to take my tracks back to nuendo do my little thing put it back into wave burner pro and if i had to tweak it Hope i had you to go did back, your little and, thing back right. and back <laughs> and i hated it so when i found sequoia that it had full multi-track capability every they call them objects, but for Pro Tools people, they'd be called regions. Every one of them has a, a row of plugins available for it. Great. Sequoia has a great crossfade editor, so I can just drag them over each other, put whatever plugins I want on each uh, object, and it has track plugins. So I can have like my final limiter on the way out and you know whatever else for a little fluffy tone control sitting there on the track. And then do precision EQ or whatever else EQ on each song individually. It's really, and is really it slight. actually dropping in CD um, song start markers and things like that, and mm -hmm. well, just I, like mastering software does. Yeah, yeah, it's just a just a little button up on the top. Put Probably a marker that's there. Sure. And, that's great. That's cool. Very yeah. cool. I actually didn't know anything about that app. Oh yeah, it now. does a DDP export and CD text and I ISRCs don't have to check and all that. that. Out. Oh, and, um, it, and it does it right from your project. There's no exporting. Right, exactly. I like that it's, it's, awesome. it's the same thing you would use to mix multi-track music or master mm -hmm. using the same thing instead of two different things. Yeah, and nobody can ever send me Pro Tools sessions. <laughs> <laughs> they got to narrow it down. Yep. All right, cool. So um, let's let's jump in a little bit more. Um, I'm just going to jump in through some some specific questions here. But, you know, you saw my studio down there. You saw my room. It's about eight feet tall. It's um, 12 feet across, I think maybe about 18 feet long or something. And I remember that, I remember being limited by the ceiling height, but picking some dimensions that, you know, looked good in the room calculator or mm -hmm. whatever. Um, but obviously with eight feet tall as a ceiling, Sounds like 70 hertz might be a challenge. And I seem to remember that it is, that there is something going on at yeah, 70 hertz. Yeah, and it, that too. depends on how close your speakers are to the back wall, how close you are to the speakers in the back wall. So, like, if you can move back, like, your, your listening spot is kind of further back. It would probably Yeah, well, have, especially now that I just put the standing desk in front of the console, oh, so yeah. it backed me up even more. But if you were up closer, you would have more of that ceiling bounce directly up from the speakers. Since you're back a little bit, that changes that frequency and puts it a little bit lower. 
Oh, interesting. Yeah. But you've also got good width and length dimensions. So that makes that 170 hertz hiccup not so egregious because the frequencies around it aren't making a huge trough. It could be a really narrow little thing where you miss one little bit of a note or one, you know, kick drum center, but that's pretty high for the kick drum center or low, whichever. But, you know, it, that doesn't necessarily mean you're screwed. It just means it's something you need to be mindful of. Plus, yeah. you've got a cloud. That helps. Yeah. And the bigger the cloud you can put up there, the the more you can do. 70 hertz is a little low for most clouds, but there's technology that can be functional there. So, Rockstars, when Dan's talking about the cloud, basically I just took a couple of long panels and I hung them from the ceiling above my speakers, sort of starting down low behind the speaker and then angling up as it comes up towards my head so that you know, if you were a speaker and you and you sent sound up to the ceiling, instead of bouncing off the ceiling and come back down to my ears, it kind of goes up and gets absorbed by the cloud, or it gets like a little bit reflected out into gets, the room above. Gets my absorbed head. a little going through, bounces back, gets absorbed a little more. Yeah, every little bit helps. All right. So, um, what about if somebody's just sort of let's just say somebody's got the flexibility to start trying some stuff? What would you say are the first things to suggest trying in their room? Acoustic like in other speaking? words, in other words, the you saw my studio. In my studio, everything's like there's big objects in the way. It's kind of a hassle for me to do much yeah. at this point. But if somebody's got lots of flexibility, um, what are some first places to start? It's probably just speaker placement and yeah, the speaker, placement of you, the listener, right? Yeah, speaker placement, listening position, uh, absorption of those first reflections. Um, if you have room for some bass traps in the front or back or both, those are great, and you can do. You know, broadband bass traps are easy to make. They don't go as low in frequency as like a tuned membrane absorber would go. And there are formulas to make those online. Uh, I am one to hire somebody who does it all day, every day. Right, right, totally. To totally. tell me or tell me, you know, what to do or what to have somebody else do. Because I, I could build that stuff and do it myself, but I got records to work on and not mediocre quality treatments what i have in there now works and i made them you know 18 years ago yeah but they're well my new my new bass traps are huge i made those recently but they're broadband they're kind of a a sledgehammer and a nail they're not tuned and they're not perfect but uh well you know we have a lot of listeners um who are working in home studios and you know who are new to all these concepts and you know, we've, we've got some listeners who are here who kind of get that they should probably put their speakers, you know, the left one and the right one symmetrically pointing at them, mm -hmm. but they're still learning that. <laughs> oh, yeah. So like, you know, setting up your speakers, basically, when you talked about symmetry, you're talking about pick an end of the room. You kind of want to be in the long end of your room, don't you? Yeah, you want, you want the long end of the room behind you. You don't want to be sitting so that the wide side is to your left and right, because the way the room, room mode distribution is in the the one that's in the center of the room if you're trying to not make this sound complicated if you're toward the long end you get further out of that mode which is a cancellation spot or a combination spot so hold on, let me see if i can picture this so if, when i say long end i think of the room as like kind of a long rectangle you definitely don't want a room that's a cube that's definitely. the worst kind of room yeah and cubes if you're suck, in a cube squares aren't rock so great. stars i'm sorry about that <laughs> But you want it so like so let's call it a a, a rectubular. How's that? I just okay. made that word out. Sure. So we're lit, we're our studios in a rectubular room, and we're we want to be in one of the um, ends of the room, not like on the. Not, we don't want to be staring at one of the long walls. Right. We want you to be, be staring at a short wall. Yeah. Right? Yeah. With most of the room behind you. Right. Exactly. And then and then I think we learned when we had Michael Cronin on that um, we want to be sort of towards the front a third of the way towards that wall. So if you think yeah. of the room as in thirds, you want to sort of put yourself right at that third, right? At that third or inside that third. Yeah. It kind of depends on everything, how big your speakers are, if you've got subs, where the low end happens to land in your spot, and what's more important to you. Some people might want a little more of that 100 hertz beef. Somebody may want a little more 40 hertz, you know, deep thump. And there's, there's always a trade-off. Until you've got, you know, Michael Cronin money. Right. And even, and even then, I mean, I've gone into plenty of really nice rooms, not speaking of his rooms in particular, but there are plenty of nice rooms in town where you go in and you're in the middle and like, well, this isn't really where I want to listen. And then, you, and then I move to the back and I'm like, oh, the 
fun bases back here. Yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. So, you know, it's, fun, it's fun to have some bass kicking, I, yeah. I think. And some people like a leaner sound. I like a pretty hefty, beefy sound. So I want to get up into that that front third, but not so far that you get the ceiling thing. Yeah. So it's a, there's a lot of trial and error involved. So let's say, um, for example, that I find myself mixing, trying to mix it so that I enjoy it from where I'm mixing. And then I print that and I take it out to the car and I think it's got fun bass on it. But as soon as I get to the car, I'm like, oh man, I fucked this up again. I got to cut some lows. And that's happening repeatedly. Do you think that that kind of experience is probably a normal part of the mixing process to just get it right? Or do you think that that is part of, you know, battling room problems that, that, you know, could be corrected? That's a room thing that could be corrected. Cause ideally you finish in your studio, print it, think that rocks. And then you take it to your car and it also rocks. Yeah. So if you're and that's been it, your experience with some great mixers as well, right? Yeah. So if you, uh, if you're going out to the car and you've always got too much bass in it, it means you're not hearing enough bass in your spot in your studio. So there's a speaker, you know, maybe if your speaker has uh, adjustments on it, you know, tweeter, mid-range controls or whatever, uh, it could be that those aren't set in the best way. It could be that you're sitting in a room mode where your speakers are actually making the bass. You're just not hearing it because of where you're sitting, in which case, you know, the cheap thing to do or the first thing to do is move probably everything closer to the wall to give yourself a little more low end reinforcement from when that. you say everything, you mean the speakers move them closer to the wall. So speakers, they can reinforce in the low end a little more. Yeah. Speakers, desk, listening position, whatever. Yeah. If, I mean, first you tried the speakers, but it could be the, where you're sitting. That's the problem. Um, I was setting up a, a room for a friend a while back and things were really, really good, but there was just one little spot where the kick drums weren't beefy. And I leaned over the desk about a foot forward and I looked at him and I said, can we move everything? And he's like, do whatever you need to do. And we moved his pro controller or whatever his control service desk was a foot and sat back down. And we're like, oh, we're done. This is great. We love it. Nice. And that was, that was all it take, takes. Well, in my studio, I've got a bench on the back wall and the bass is always kicking there. Mm-hmm. And it's a funny shaped bench. So there's like, it's kind of like a cubby. So of course you get kind of this boxed in bass too back there too bass is always going to be jamming in the back of any room yeah exactly and that's not ideal but it is definitely where i can get a better sense of what's going on with the bass and um the trick that i've been doing that i really enjoy and somebody had asked me about this on one one of my videos where i was going around the studio recording myself as well um it's such a great and simple way to control your mix from where whichever part of the room you want to be in which is if you're mixing on a laptop uh, or if you're mixing on a Mac as your studio computer, for example, I just take my laptop and use the built-in Mac screen sharing feature. And then I just carry the laptop around the room and you see in the whole same screen that you're mixing on with your studio computer. Oh, yeah. So that's really handy. I'll just like sit on the back of the room and like kind of, you know, mute the kick and the bass because otherwise you're like getting up and running across the studio, muting something, coming back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get up and run. Um, and then sometimes I like to even take that an extra level further and st- try and stream the track out to my car and see if I can take that out to the car to control it as well. It starts falling apart a little bit when I get that far away from the <laughs> control room. <laughs> the delay is a little insane. I've actually, you know, done a tweak, press play on the laptop in the car and then waited for up to a minute to hear the music go by. And that's like, that's where mm, you go. That's, yeah. that's insane. I think I'll just print a mix and, and go see what it sounds like. Yeah. By then you might as well just run some wires out to the car. Um, so here's another question. How should someone go about adding new monitors to their studio? Uh, you've had experience helping people set up their monitors. I'm guessing, I think you helped um, Bobby mm-hmm. set his up, right, too? Yeah. Um, but I think you, so you probably had experience helping people like determine whether, you know, what should they get for a new monitor as well? What are your thoughts on that? You know, like if somebody's thinking about getting new monitors, you know, for me, one way I think about it is maybe if I have a friend at the music store who can let me take some home and just try them out, mess with them and see how they sound. Are there any other sort of like rules of thumb about choosing the right monitor as well, a new one? Nothing is better than getting speakers in your room and listening to them and getting them set up. Uh, I always encourage everybody who's got small speakers, if they're not full range to get two subs. And if you can. Okay. Yeah. Let's talk about that more. I think that's come up a couple of times on the podcast. Why do we need two subs instead of just one? Well, everybody says bass is mono, but 
I mean, three hertz is mono. 50 isn't. Like, you, if you have a sub on the right side, and if you, you mute the speakers, you can hear that it's on the right. Okay. I mean, unless your crossover is set at like 40 hertz, you're going to hear something. And I want it to be completely balanced left to right, no matter what. I guess that makes a lot of sense, man. I'm, I'm, if I was about to get trampled by an elephant and I didn't know which way it was coming from, I'd be fucked. Yeah. <laughs> so avoid the elephant and have a, and have a sub on both sides. <laughs> All right, dig it. So, so if we find a sub we like, we should just automatically be thinking about getting two of them. Yeah, because they're, they're going to be reproducing up to 80 hertz, maybe more. The crossover is going to allow a little bit more above that. So there may be 110, 120 hertz still coming out of a sub. It's going to be attenu- attenuated to some degree, but it's going to interact with the with the main speakers. So you want equal interaction on that. Plus you get more headroom because you've got twice as much woofer trying to play the bass. So you're not having your one little sub on the right or not even in the middle. Don't ever put a sub in the middle of a room. Um, Oops. <laughs> Wait, the, the middle of the room or the middle of between the speakers? The middle between the speakers against the wall. Oops. That's a, that's a well, you need another, another sub apparently. <laughs> I do. But, you know, that's where you get a front back cancellation right straight from there. And if you can put your speaker, your subs next to your speakers, or if your corners are close in your corners, you can get a lot of room reinforcement, dial the gains back, and get more headroom out of it. So, well, they're not part, partly it's also because um, scientifically, all room nodes coalesce in the corners, right? So mm-hmm. whatever speaker you put in that corner is getting 100% reinforcement throughout the room. Is that one way to think of it? Yeah. So you don't have, there's two reflections removed, maybe three. Somebody's going to check me on that and curse me. But there are some reflections that are taken out of play because they're where the reflections start. Right. So you get uh, the room gain bump. So little subs give you a little bit more love and big subs make it even better. And uh, it's just the smoothest way to to do it, unless you've got a massively tuned and treated room. Right. All right. So we've got our speakers. We've experimented um, with moving them forward and back from the wall and moving ourselves forward and back from the wall to sort of get, find what feels like a sweet spot for the low end, Mm -hmm. essentially, right? Um, What about the, um, how wide apart should the speakers be? Are there any rules of thumb as far as that goes? Because obviously you probably don't want them too far to the left and right close to the walls. No, you want, you know, the the equilateral triangle thing that everybody talks about is pretty solid. Occasionally I find a speaker that works a little better, maybe a little wider and pointed directly at the ears, or maybe not quite as wide and pointed a little bit outside the ears. I kind of use that as a, a little bit of a tuning method. If it's a little bit too bright, or the image isn't quite right, you know, just a couple of degrees of tilt out can fix it. Right. So the, the tweeter is now sort of shooting past your ear just a little bit. Yeah. So and it doesn't, and instead it's of not directly, laser beaming you. Yeah. Instead of, but like by a matter of inches, because the, the response of a tweeter is the, the loudest directly on axis. So if you're a little too bright, just cancel them out a little bit. Right. Or if you've got like some speakers are designed to be pointed straight out and, I don't normally prefer that. So if I turn them in a little bit, I get a little more solid of an image if that doesn't make it too bright. Is there, are there any particular tweeter designs that we're going to see that are the ones that are designed to be pointed straight out? Because I know um, I've, seen, I've seen sort of like traditional, well, you got like um, my NS10s have a, a plastic tweeter, I guess, like, right? Or some kind of Mylar thing or yeah. something. I don't know. Um, and then you have like, you know, round dome tweeters, but then you also have these sort of corrugated ribbon tweeters. Well, you know, I haven't really thought about that. I guess maybe the ribbons might be a little more directional. You generally assume that there's a fair bit of dispersion for a tweeter. Right. But dispersion gets wider as you go further down in frequency. Right. So the way you point, your pointing is going to change that nonlinearly. So it's going to be a bit of a brightness control. Like PMCs are often made to be pointed straight out. And I've heard some of those pointed straight on that are a little brighter than I like. And then you tilt them out and that kind of mellows it. Okay. I don't, I don't know that there's a particular speaker or tweeter design or material that lends one way or another. There are so many variables in the design of a speaker that, you know, no, no telling why this way or that way. So like, does this fix it? Yeah. Great. Okay, cool. So uh, speakers close and far from the wall, you close and far from the wall. Helps with low end. 
sub uh, subs in the bottom left and right corners, like right in the corner of yeah. the room. In the oh, corners, and do, don't or you fire them the into stands. the corner as opposed to firing them out from the corner? Uh, it depends on the sub. Okay. All right. So then that helps with the low end as well. And then an equilateral triangle basically means the distance between the speaker um, is also the same distance that yeah. one of the speakers is to the your head. Your, all, your, yeah. All three sides of the triangle are the same. Yeah. Okay. Dig it. Um, and then what about uh, imaging? You talked about that. Is there is that kind of once you get these other things in place and you get them right, that helps with the imaging, or is that more about these first reflections being treated right? Well, the first reflections being treated right is getting the imaging right. When you've got your speakers in the right size triangle where you've got a good solid center image where the snare is like right there in front of you and the vocals, like background vocals or guitars aren't like disembodied side things, but it's far enough a while, a, apart for it to sound huge, you're probably in pretty good shape there. Yeah. And then you want to do your acoustic treatments on the sides where the first bounce happens that way, uh, you know, directly out to your left and right, which is going to be halfway between you and your speakers, which, you know, the old thing, put a mirror on the wall yeah. and where you see its speaker, put a treatment there. Yeah. Like that flies. First thing you have that, to ask yourself why the old thing, why were there mirrors hanging around in the control room? Well, you know, some people <laughs> really like to see themselves and you never know. But I mean, I've had my wife going around like holding a speaker against the wall and I'm like lower, lower, lower there and put Hold a pin the in mirror it. against the yeah. wall. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah you know, exactly. a, little, a little flat bathroom mirror Yeah, and to put a pin in it. And the first time I did it uh, in my old house is everywhere that I saw a speaker on the, you know, and a reflection on the wall, I made a treatment for it. And what was your, what do you remember being the feeling after you did that? <sighs> nice. Like it, the room got more comfortable. You know, the reflections off the walls died. I had a big couch in the room. I still do. Cause they do a little bit of soaking up with some mid bass and yeah. give you a nice place to sit. Yeah. And over couch, call. it yeah. makes a good bass trap. And you know, the imaging gets bigger, the ceiling, you know, acoustically doesn't quite disappear, but it's less apparent. And things are just larger and smoother sounding, and you hear more of what the speaker and the music is supposed to sound like, and less of what the room interaction with all this stuff sounds yeah. like. Yeah, and then those panels that you're putting up when you're, you know, finding all these mirror spots where you can see the speaker, they don't have to be huge either, right? They could be uh, a two by four is plenty big enough for that panel. Um, isn't that about right? Or sometimes maybe even a two by two panel might be helpful there. Or two by four feet. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, norm, I mean, I try to do... Like, like the, those Oralex panels, for example, those can even be helpful in that situation. Yeah, I go. I would go more for a DIY, probably uh, mineral wool or like recycled denim fiber, just because you can make them exactly the size you want and make them a lot bigger, yeah. a lot cheaper. And if you can put a little airspace behind them, it'll lower the frequency where it's functional. So, that, I mean, if you've got a bunch of money to buy pre-made treatments... That's great. When I got started, I didn't. So yeah. I spent a weekend in my garage making my own, and I bought scads and scads of mineral fiber and Owens Corning 703 compressed fiberglass. How long were you itching after that? Oh, forever. <laughs> um, you know, I did it in, in long sleeve shirts and gloves, and it's and you know a respirator when I was cutting stuff. You know, yeah, you got to be careful. That stuff in. Yeah, and if I was making them now, I'd probably use denim. Yeah, I love the fact that we recycled blue jeans are part of making great records. Yeah, isn't that great? I mean, it's, so I've never bought the recycled denim. What? Um, I, but I remember uh, Robin Eaton. You know, he was putting that with Brad Jones into their studio years ago. Um, what do we need to know about that? Is that hard to find? Is that very? Oh no, it's now? an insulation product. You can go buy it at Home Depot. What a trip! Okay, cool. Yeah. All right. And you buy it compressed, and you un you know unbag it, and it does like a memory foam bed. And so then you would just kind of make a a panel. That had thick sides on it and and uh, and some stretch fabric and then just load it up with this recycled denim. Mm -hmm. All right, dig it. Um, let's see what else do I want to ask you about. Uh, you spent a lot of time working with um, F. Reed, shipping. Oh yeah, I assist I assisted him for two and a half, three and a half years, I think. Um, what were some takeaways that you want to share with us? Stuff that you remember learning from that experience? Well, one of the the biggest things I learned about that was that I was better at seeing the forest than I was the trees. We were set up at a studio where we had it kind of locked out. And uh, I had a seat directly behind him in what was basically a second sweet spot. It was Carl Tatz's 
recording arts at the time. And it was before Carl Tatt's designs, but he was well, well into, uh, you know, studio acoustics. He had done the room. And was it, was it his room still at that point? Or yeah. No? Yeah. So did he have all the fancy sodas in the fridge still then? Oh yeah, man. The fridge was legendary. <laughs> And I, I wish I liked ginger ale then as much as I do now, because he had like spicy stuff. Everybody loved it. It's great. And he had those, uh, those cookies with the chocolate in the middle. Uh, those were good times. Um, but his room sounded great, and I got to sit in a good spot right behind Reed, listening to great stuff. And uh, by then we were printing everything digitally, and we had master links, and you know those those things were everywhere like Tic Tacs. So that's right. We'd print mixes and I'd, you know scuttle off with something at home and. Uh, mess with it a little bit and say, Hey man, what do you think of that? And he goes, oh, that sounds pretty good. So I just kind of practiced and practiced and other things I learned about that, not related to mastering, but you know, studio hang skills, like being, being quiet at the right times, saying something at the right times. Um, I met him and he was at the time assisting for Rick Will who has been out of Nashville for a while, but he was a badass engineer. Yeah. And uh, I showed up with three or four other guys from MTSU. And uh, over the course of a week of a session with a high-profile artist who was he was really great, and he was kind of particular about things, one guy showed up with a stack of CDs and asked for an autograph. Don't do that. Uh, and <laughs> Wait, one of, one of the assistants did? One of the interns Wow. Who had just like stepped in the first week of meeting these guys. That's hilarious. And another guy gave a production tip from the back of the room. And I sat around looking like, man, I cannot believe these guys are doing this. And, uh, you know, the biggest lesson I got out of that was I crinkled a bag of Cheetos once and I got a little side eye and I thought, oh my God, I'm making too much noise. I need to be more invisible. And uh, so as far as coming in and getting into a session, Knowing when to pipe up and when to yeah. not is really important. It's really funny. I, I get to experience all different variations of that in my studio environment with different interns and you know people that are new. And honestly, when an intern comes in and completely says the wrong thing, it kind of cracks me up because sometimes they do it. And it's just so funny. It's like it's like a punchline to a joke. You mm -hmm. know? You're like, I can't believe you just said that. You yeah, know? <laughs> sometimes that's when you learn things that you remember. Yeah, you know, I did some bad stuff as an intern. I've told those stories before. Uh, but um, yeah, well, so, and then the, the crinkly thing too, I think that's something that I didn't really realize until later. I mean, I, I did, like, I remember I, if I wanted to sneak in to the studio, I would try and open the door quietly. So it didn't, cause I, you know, I, I had done enough work trying to mix music or work in front of the speakers myself that I knew that you, you know, it was disruptive. You didn't want to be disrupted. So mm -hmm. I didn't want to disrupt whoever else was working there. But especially now that I'm, when I'm mixing, I know the value of mixing at low, low volume. Mm -hmm. And it's funny to me how I'll like turn the speaker way down and I'll put it on my mono or tone and I'll be making, you know, making some judgment calls. And when you turn it that low, you have, you really have to pay attention. You know, you really got to listen critically mm -hmm. and people in the back of the room take that as a cue to start talking loudly. Yeah. You know? This is not chat time. <laughs> this is the engineers paying attention to things time. I'm like, you guys, it's not down quiet. Cause I'm not listening. Yeah, if I, I was doing this for you, I wouldn't be in the studio with you right now. I'd be doing something else. So yeah. Anyway, reminder to all you rock stars, uh, l listen quietly when you can. And if somebody else is listening quietly, shut the fuck up. Yeah. But when they ask you a question, if you have something interesting to say, say it. You know, don't be meek. Right. Just be cautious. Yeah. But what about if they didn't ask you? Don't do that. What about if it seems like everybody's like bouncing ideas around in the studio right now? Don't do that. <laughs> like interns aren't generally there to contribute. They're there to absorb and learn. Yeah. Well, contribute, but contribute invisibly and contribute yeah. by like, you know, washing the dishes and making sure the trash goes out. And yeah, and seeing that the sure engineer is kind of looking around for a water, like have one yeah. there. Or if they have, you know, a cup of coffee at the same time every day, like have it there for them. You're going to impress people with stuff like that and make them remember you. Like you can do nothing and be good. You can screw up. But if you're remembered for doing something that made the session go better without being obtrusive, I mean, that's valuable. True. Well, this is also just like the given value that if you can figure out um, what makes everybody more comfortable in the studio and mm -hmm. what makes them work better, 
and try and, you know, invisibly help them with those things. I mean, that's what we do as engineers. Yeah. We were basically working with an artist, a client, a producer, whatever, and we're trying to figure out how to enable them like crazy, you know? Yeah. And look, you, and look three or four steps down the road. Yeah. Don't just think about what's right now. Think about what's going to like, listen to what's being said. I mean, some of this is, is assistant talk and not intern talk, Yeah, but keep an eye on what's down the road. And if you're an intern working with an assistant, like you can talk to them, assuming that they tell you that it's okay. But you just like, Hey, I thought we'd do this and this. And then maybe you're like, Oh yeah, that's a great idea. Go ahead and, you know, get that mic stand set up somewhere in the back because that's coming down the road you can make yourself useful you just need to be smart about when you do it yeah well i mean i was thinking about your coffee example too i mean it's like you can look at getting somebody coffee as a a nice gesture but you could also look at it as if that engineer that you're there to learn from really likes coffee and you really want to learn a lot from that engineer and you make them super comfy they might just do better work and you might get just get to witness them doing better work yeah because you helped make them uh, work better. Yeah, vibe is king. So if you, everybody feels good, better stuff happens. Nice. All right, well, let's take a break for a sec. We'll come back in for the jam session. Rockstars, I want to remind you that you can find links to everything we're talking about in the show notes, including a YouTube playlist of Dan's great work. And that's right there. Just click through on your phone or go to rsrockstars.com. And if you're learning how to mix yourself now, I've got a free course you can take at mixmasterbundle.com. Shows you how to mix multi-tracks using free plugins and stock plugins that will work for you in any DAW, in any DAW, no matter whether you're mixing it on Pro Tools, Logic Studio One, or whatever. And uh, go check it out. We'll see you guys in just a minute for the jam session. Roswell Pro Audio brings you microphone design that is out of this world. Endorsed by a growing list of artists and producers like Phil Collin of Def Leppard, Ross Hogarth, who's recorded Van Halen, Ziggy Marley, and the Doobie Brothers, and Super Dupes, working with Drake, Mary J. Blige, and Eminem. These are all rock stars that have discovered just how great Roswell microphones sound. Check out the Mini K47, which uses a capsule modeled on the one in the vintage U47 at a street price of only $299. Or the beautiful Delphos condenser microphone with a capsule tuned like the vintage U67 with great clarity and far lower noise at a street price of only $899. In fact, you are hearing my voice right now on the beautiful Delphos microphone. These mics are carefully crafted by hand and immediately feel good even before you plug them in and hear how great they sound. These are well-built microphones that will last you and your studio a lifetime of great recording. Check out more audio examples of these awesome mics at roswellproaudio.com. Hey, rock stars, we're back now for the jam session. My guest today is Dan Scheich. Dan, are you ready to jam? Jamming time. So, dude, I want to start digging into some questions about the records you've made and really talk about mastering. Um, and just making great records. So this first one is a band called ASG, Win Us Over. And one of the things I noticed about that record, which sounded killer, is that you've got smashing cymbals and guitars, but the top end is really smooth. And I wondered if you wanted to share any tips um, or just kind of talk about getting the highs just right on a record and not completely screwing that up or making it rip our heads off. Well, I... Got to say, the credit for that probably goes more to the mixer, Matt Hyde, than it does to me. Because when we did that record, he said, you know, we're looking for kind of a, I don't know if he said it or if I in- interpreted it, but kind of a brown sounding stoner rock record. Brown sounding stoner rock record. Yeah. And I mean, that stuff is right up my alley. Those harmonics in the in the riff are just so, so tasty. But they get a little sharp. You got to be careful of that. And the cymbals were mixed pretty mellow. Right. So in, in that case, it kind of was like dial up some high end until it's a little shiny, but it's not supposed to be a really shiny record. So the music kind of dictates to me, like, this is guitars and drums. And was that also a, a master for vinyl that I think you shared with me for the YouTube? Uh, no, that one, you, I you may have come mentioned there. Well, they did a, a vinyl re release many years later, but I wasn't involved in that. Oh, okay. Um, well, hopefully I got the right one in there, but we'll find out. Well, whatever. It sounds good. <laughs> yeah. It was, good music is good music. Yeah. That's, that's as, I, as I was going through all these, seeing the differences that uh, are available for every song on YouTube, I'm like, well, this one sounds better than that one. And that one is weird on the left and yeah. whatever. So hopefully I sent you all the right stuff. I think, yeah, the stuff you sent me sounded great. Um, all right, cool. So 
What about mastering for vinyl? Do you have any comments you want to make about that? I mean, is that something that you get asked to do? Oh, yeah, I do that a lot. Uh, I deliver 24-bit 96K files for that. Um, I back their their output level down a little bit. If it's something that's limited really hard, I might back that down a little bit. I didn't even think about that. So let's mention why you would deliver a 2496K file for mastering for vinyl. Why isn't it a 44116 bit? Well, because putting dither on a record would be a crime. <laughs> so <laughs> let me let me let me see if I can understand it. So forty four one sixteen bit is what you would deliver as a CD mastered yes. format. That's what would burn onto a CD and get played back in my car. Yeah. But if it's mastered for vinyl, well, then it's going to the vinyl pressing plant, and they're going to convert it back to analog and cut the record with it, which is why you sent them a high resolution file, right? Yes. Okay. So they're getting the full twenty four bit. They're getting no dither noise. No sample rate conversion because I work at 96K most of the time, 88.2 if something comes in at 88.2. But a lot of my equipment is a little happier working at the higher sample rates. And since I'm only using two tracks, I've got the horsepower for it. Um, the other things that I do for for the vinyl is I make sure that there's no crazy sub bass going out because digital can play back anything, but vinyl can't. And I make sure that there's not too much high-end or s stuff going on because too many S's will kick the needle out of it. Now, I know with vinyl records, we we had house music and electronic music has been going back uh, for some time. But I always kind of wondered whether this, you know, the EDM craze with the pumping low end and everything, would that have existed if it could have in the in the age of vinyl? Or is that really something that is born of the digital medium? The way the production is made now is probably born of the digital medium, but vinyl can play bass. Okay. You know, it's just a matter of how wide uh, you want your grooves to be and how short of a playtime you can give up. Right. You know, hip hop, vinyl all over the place. It's just, but if it's one song on a 12 inch record, you can make really, really wide grooves and put tons and tons of bass in that thing. You know, I was listening on um, Amazon Music. I just like called up a hip hop playlist. And then heard a bunch of tracks. I think it was like Drake and stuff like that. And um, there was a lot of stuff that sounded really great. And but I felt like the low end was reaching much lower in frequencies, where like where you could crank the subs all the way up in the car if you wanted to. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, Alexa, play old school hip hop. And it started pulling up DMC and stuff like that. And it was such a different treatment of low end. It was like yeah. the bass was actually a lot louder on the final version. But I think it was like a higher frequency range for the bass. It was more, you know, the 100 down to, I don't know what. Yeah, you know. 60, 70, 80, not, yeah. not ringing the bells at 38 hertz. Yeah, exactly. Which I love. You, you know. like the higher, the old no, I, I like that. I like both, but I yeah. love uh, one of my favorite songs, this Redhead Kingpin song uh, called we Rock, we Rock the Mic Right. Didn't work on it. Listened to it when I was a kid. But it's got this little second 808 thing that just happens every once in a while. And it's like, boom, it just is so deep and under that under there that the regular lean 808 is great, but you get this extra bonus of long lingering 808 and you get a contrast to that, which yeah, I think okay. is really, really great. So some of that stuff was back there in the eighties. There was, uh, there were, you know, DJ magic, Mike and MC ADE were base for sport records. Basically they weren't great MCs. Their tracks were interesting but basically they were vehicles for subwoofers to get blown out in. Love it. Oh, like my first time I heard a booming system go by in high school, my hair on my arms stood up. I'm like, oh, I got to get me I one of those. That. I have it. <laughs> nice, man. I didn't realize we were going to get to talk about so much hip hop, but I love it. I, clearly you're a fan of hip hop coming into this too. Oh yeah. Uh, 80s and 90s hip hop. I, I know more than a lot of people. Um, all right. So let's talk about, Low end. Um, let's talk about some of the methods that you use to feel confident about low end. Are there tools? I like, is everything about ears and having that come out of your speakers right? Are there some additional visual tools that help you, you know, get a handle on what's going on with the low end when you're I, at this point when you're mastering? Um, no, really, when it, when it feels fun and not overpowering and my overall levels are good, I'm done. You know, it's it's taste for everything. Some stuff lends itself to a great big rolling low end, 
and some stuff lends itself to being a little lean or a little tighter, but it's, it's usually in what is sent. And my goal is to make the base big and impressive, but not overpower nice mid range and clear high end. So yeah. it's a little, you know, it's kind of a wavy thing to find the right spot. And it seems weird, but sometimes too much low end can overtake vocals. Right. Totally. I mean, they're in totally different frequency ranges, but if you're too busy hearing this, you're not hearing that. Well, and I feel like, in, you know, the car is sort of always the place where I listen to most music and where I get a sense of whether something's right or wrong. Um, believe it or not, more so than in the studio. The studio is where I know how things sound based on recording them and mixing them myself, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've heard in the car particularly, there are times where if I feel like I've gotten the low end wrong, the vocals sound distorted when I'm trying to turn up the mix, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, if you've got too much low end coming out and you've got a limiter on, you might be modulating the limiter on the low end, which is making your vocal tremble. Right. So you got to make sure that you're not having, you either use a limiter that, well, maybe not that much limiting or not that much super sub coming out because when everything's working right, it's not going to make that flutter happen. Right. So you know what I'm talking about, the kind of the flutter yeah. distortion on the vocal. Yeah. Good, and, yeah. and that could be because the car stereo is funny at right. a Right. Well, maybe the car stereo just can't handle that. Man, what if the mix and master itself, you play it on, on other things and you don't hear that flutter, but again, when you try and bring it up in the car, you hear it. Might that be an indication that there's just too much sub information going on, that the car is just like, I can't even handle this, even though it's low in the mix or something like that? Oh, I mean, it varies from car to car. You know, some cars have really high-end systems that can play back anything just fine. Some cars don't have good enough systems to even try to play bass that deep, or they may have filters to keep it from playing that deep so that you don't blow up your speakers. Yeah. So it varies based on everything and everything. But generally, uh, when I'm when I'm happy in my studio, I'm happy. I don't go. I don't do car checks. You know. Okay. Cool. Yeah. All right. I guess I was uh, wondering if there were any guidelines for getting confident about your own car stereo system. I guess, you know, if you can play stuff off of Spotify and that sounds groovy and then you play your own mix and it doesn't. Yeah. And then you've got more work to do. Yeah. Right? It's a relativity thing. If it sounds good on the thing that you always listen on, um, the stuff you make should sound good on that too. One of the things that people want to come over for their mastering sessions I say, you know, you're welcome to come over and check things out. But for first listen, I need you to take the masters and listen where you're most comfortable. Yeah. Because if you listen in a car or your living room or your studio or whatever, that's great. Make sure that you get it there and love it. Or if you want to change something and you want to come over, we can. But don't come and make sonic judgments off of my speakers that you've never heard before. Yeah. Because, you know, it's 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 not a... It's not a known change if you haven't heard it where you're used to. Invariably, when somebody comes over to do that, they take it home like, oh, can we just do a little bit of this, a little bit of that? And I'm like thinking to myself, well, if you would have listened at home, you would have maybe told me that the first time and we would have saved a trip. Yeah, and totally. most of the time they just get their stuff, they hear it, they love it, or we make a little tweak and we're done and they don't come over at all. Or else they may have some some gaps they want to adjust or maybe just come hang out. Because sometimes it's just nice to sit and have a drink and chill and chit-chat and listen to some I music. used to love it, man. Um, Jim Domain was one of the first mastering engineers mm -hmm. I've worked with a lot. And uh, it was like the favorite day for me to take the finished mixes and go over and master. It was because I got to go start. I got really good coffee. <laughs> And then I just got to sit there and listen and enjoy while he did stuff and made everything sound better all day. And I totally got a little bit of that experience where it was like, you know, if I tried to make judgment calls on those speakers, I didn't really know them and mm -hmm. necessarily. And ultimately, I could tell things more quickly if I heard them where I was familiar with it. But just the experience of being there, I was always like, I always had this sense that the mastering guys had it lucky because in such a short, condensed amount of time, they could make stuff sound so much better. You know? Yeah, it's 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 pretty cool, and you can do a lot. Yeah, and I'm not really one of those hands off, don't do much of anything to anything kind of guys. I kind of, you know, put the pedal to the floor, and not in a making it loud for sport sort of way. But I want to enhance everything to you know sound big and huge 
all the time yeah. when it's appropriate. You want to rock that subwoofer. Yeah, if you have one. Um, let's talk about loudness. Um, how loud should records be? How do we know for different styles of music that we produce? I don't spend a whole lot of time with that. I mean, I've I've kind of got the loudness where I tend to make things, and that's often influenced by uh, the heated mixes that come in. Because sometimes people send, you know, they do their regular mix, and then they do one with the limiter for the client. Like maybe this guy right here is interviewing. Yeah, you. which is which is great. <laughs> I just want both. Uh, the, I got burned on that the very first time somebody heated a mix. I did this hip hop record that was like really gritty and organic, and I made it dark and beefy and punchy and feedback was like yeah we're really going for you know something a little brighter i'm like well these mixes read to me like you know 90s new york city and they sent me what they were listening to which was in a master link with uh like a plus 10 db at 15k and 12 db of limiting <laughs> like, oh well yeah it's not even the same mix yeah we made it two different records so after that it was always Send me both. I want to hear what the clients hear. Yeah. I want to know what's on everybody's mind. But I sit here and tweak little bitty things like limiting and tiny EQ changes with great attention. And most of the time, mixers are, I mean, a general overstatement here. So don't nobody be mad, but they're slapping a limiter on there to make it loud. Sometimes it gets a little overcooked, but sometimes it's the perfect reference of what they like. And I can go to that point, maybe a little further maybe right at that same spot, but with a different frequency balance or bring out a vocal. But I, my, my loudness is based on the density of sound that I want to hear, not whether it's going to be played on this thing or that thing or the other thing. If it gets turned down one or two dB on YouTube, who cares? Right. I mean, if it sounds good, it sounds good. I'm not doing stuff that's so loud that it's getting turned down 6 dB and is full of distortion. So that hasn't been something that has been anything I've heard feedback on or much of a request for. Okay. I mean, do master it for iTunes. That has a little bit of its own. Do you want to, um, do you want to share any insights into what, why that's relevant and stuff like that? The whole getting turned down thing. Oh, because of all the different uh, streaming services that aim for their volume levels. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, you've got Spotify and iTunes, iTunes music, not the iTunes like individual song store. So you got two different levels to deal with from iTunes um youtube has a, a volume level everybody has their own little target and nobody and that's, wants, that's because of the whole loudness matching between different yeah, songs right yeah They're trying to keep everything ballpark yeah but i've seen that fail you know a song that's got a four minute intro or not a four minute quiet thing and then one big old loud chorus at the end like that screws up a whole s single song measuring thing and a song that's like balls out from moment one to the end, if those two things are on the same record, the loud parts are going to be very, very different. So I just let the systems do what they're going to do. And if yeah. anybody needs anything, they can ask for it. But I'm yeah. not going to deliver 19 different kinds of parts right, totally. varied by 1 dB here and 2 dB there. Like if it sounds good, a couple dB variation is going to be fine. Yeah, totally. Well, I think there's a good lesson there too. And, you know, what I'm hearing you talk about, there's just the communication with the client, which is like, um, when you're, whether you're mixing, whether you're playing guitar on a record, whether you're mastering, you know, you still got that opportunity to kind of do what you do and then learn to let the the person you're doing it for just communicate back to you what they want. Well, you the know, communication. In their, back in their, wherever they're listening, in the car or wherever, you know. Yeah, and communication is the most important thing. And I am very clear with everybody. is like, if you want to change, if it's worth saying, like, so it's like, I don't know if we should do this. And I'm like, if you feel a change, it's worth trying out because right. at the end of the day, you need to love this record and, and I'm going to be done with it and maybe not listen to it ever again, or I may listen to it every three weeks for the rest of my life. But I need the customer to know that they're getting what they want and to be able to get it. And sometimes they send in screaming loud mixes and they want screaming loud masters and they get them because nobody's sending in a mix that, you know, peaks at, you know, minus four LUFS and wants to get it back at minus eight. Right. It's like somebody finished that and went like, yes, this is loud and rocking. Like, I'm not going to send it back any louder than that, but, you know, I'm probably going to adjust the low end a little bit because when stuff's made that loud, usually the loud part at the end, you lose a little bit of low end because of all the stuff you're shoving into that limiter. 
So there's always a little bit of adjustment to be made to even make super loud stuff yeah. sound great. Well, and that's like, what I figure. You know, like for somebody who's mixing, um, they do the heated mix. We're probably just taking whatever loudness thing we've got and we're just cranking it up a little more and, mm -hmm. you know, judging what we hear and, and doing that. Um, sometimes I might even listen to that while I'm mixing, you know, kind of check against the mix. Yeah, but if I get a ballpark, I'm, I'm actually checking it against the louder thing and trying to like do some balances. Mm -hmm. But I, I realize there are pitfalls you can get into too. So if you're listening through your limiter, you're, if you're mixing to and listening to the heated track, you can over push the uh, differences in volume, the, um, the relative differences between things, right? Mm -hmm. In fact, um, uh, let's see, who was I talking to about that on the podcast? We were talking about the 80s and F, um, FM radio coming in, and the compression is a big part of why the big giant snare drum effect came into being was because it was hitting the radio compression, and it like, might have sounded a little bit odd on the mix itself, but over radio it sounded killer. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I wanted to ask you about uh, parallel processing. I want to know if that's sort of an important part of the mastering process and then just ask you to explain to those of us who have never done that, how does that work? Um, and where would you add something like that in a mastering chain for it to be useful? Um, parallel processing is taking a processed signal and mixing it with the unprocessed signal and, you know, blending them together to get an effect. That's something that is done a lot in mixing with, you know, three snares one with a crack, one with a sustain, one with a low end, or three different vocals to get this and that. Um, it's not done as much in mastering, but it is done. Like I've got a compressor with a blend knob on it. And sometimes just like if you get a really cool sound, but it's just a little too grabby or a little too obtrusive, but it's got a thing that's great. I'll just back that little blend down until okay. it, it finds a spot. But, you know, up at the end, you don't want to like have a blend in your, your final limiter because you need absolute level control. Right. But in a in an outboard compressor along the way, that can be that can be useful. Um, I guess I was wondering, uh, well, you answered the question, but in my mind I imagine that there were times where you sort of liked the general level of something or you liked the punch, but you really just wanted that effect where all the details are sort of brought forward. And I wondered if that was a use for parallel compression. Uh, in this, in the mastering process, where you're sort of like hi hyper enhancing stuff, but keeping it way down low in the blend. Not really in my in my methods. Some of that gets done in the limiting when you're, you know, sitting on your kicks and snares, and those are really the only things that are getting uh, getting adjusted by the limiter. It kind of brings everything else up by default. Yeah. That does that. Because, you know, my style just isn't one that is that has done that much. I've done it on occasion, but you know, everybody kind of has the thing that they do. And that's not really one of the things that I do a lot of. Dig it. Cool. Um, uh, here's a question about snare drum. The day breaks was one of the records you shared with me. It's got a great snare that like really punches through even on listening, just on the laptop speakers. Mm -hmm. Um, can you share any tips on getting punchy drums and having great dynamics on a final mix and master? Um, on the mix side, I would say don't be afraid of making them kind of loud. Man. You know, we're talking kind of close mics too, right? The, yeah. The Again, drum I, I, haven't, I haven't touched a microphone in 18 years, so I'm hardly the uh, the person to ask on that. But in in mastering, there's a lot you can do to, to, to bring out a little bit of a snare crack. You know, there's times where I'll do a little bit of a, a center EQ at like, you know, 1.5 or 1.8 or make a narrow little notch and kind of just drag it around during the song until I get like that little crack spot and then listen to it and make sure that that doesn't screw up something else. Right. Because in everything, mastering, everything affects everything else. Yeah. So you can't screw up a vocal tone for the sake of a snare drum. But usually, you know, a dB and a half and a really tiny little notch right where the snare is probably isn't going to affect anything too bad. But then you can also bring up a big old wide... 8K shelf to put Sparkle on if the rest of the music can handle that too. But the interactivity of what EQ does to a master limits that a little bit, but some of the the, the mid-side multiband gadgetry out there can let you needle into it a little bit more. Yeah. And mid-side is basically we're taking 
what starts as a left and right um, channel of a mix, we process it so that we now have control of just what's in the middle and we have control of just the differences which make up the only the stereo um, sides. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you listen to the, the side of a mid-side equation, what you're hearing in the sides is everything that doesn't exist in both speakers at the same time, right? Yeah, so if you mute your center, you get that swimmy head, totally out of phase, horrible sounding thing that nobody likes. Then you just right. unmute it and put it right back. But that's a good way sometimes to isolate something. You know, sometimes you want to put a little more beef in guitars, but if, if they're panned appropriately, if you want to put a little beef into that, you can crank up a little bit of 400 hertz without making your vocals boxy. In the sides. Yes, in the sides. Because in this case... That's because your guitars were probably panned to the left and right. Yeah, and if they're barely panned, it's not going to work. Right. So again, it all depends on whatever is whatever else is going on. Um, any other rules of thumb about uh, if you have a mid side EQ available and and you've got the low cut feature um, when you're mixing, for example, um, is it safe to sort of automatically filter a little bit more lows on the sides? I don't automatically filter anything. Okay. Like if there's too much low end somewhere, I'll filter it. And, you know, I think my limiter has a 10 Hertz high pass on it just to catch any extraneous, ridiculous stuff. But most of the time, uh, that's how that stuff is pretty cleaned out before it gets to me. Yeah. If it's there, occasionally a kick drum is out of hand or I see an occasional song that has a, a snare or it's really funny is a hi hat sample that has like a 20 hertz impulse, like maybe the mic was too close to the hat when the sample yeah. was made. Yeah. So there's this boom, 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 on every hi-hat. So then I'll go ahead and dial in a filter, but nothing gets just filtered by default. I could see how someone might think that it makes sense to do a side filter to clean out mud, but why add phase shift to something with a filter if you don't need to? Right. Okay, cool. All right, good advice. Um, DSing. That's one of those things that I remember wanting to request of the mastering. It's like, well, couldn't we just DS it a little bit more? Um, but then the mastering engineer might say, well, if you do that, it's DSing the whole mix. Do you want to talk about the process of like, uh, is there a way that if there's too much sibilance in the mix, maybe we didn't notice it when we were mixing, but maybe it gets enhanced at the mastering process and starts to come out. Um, what thoughts do you want to share about that? Uh, DSing is crucial. I think. I mean, it doesn't get done to everything, but when stuff needs it, it is because it needed it. And usually if, if you feel like a DSer is needed, it's because the S's are so much louder than everything else. And is that something that can happen at like at your stage and the mastering stage? Oh yeah. If somebody wants to, you know, they make kind of a average brightness mix, but then they crank that 10 K on the vocal. Well, once I brighten up the mix to make it have the thing that the mix needs, then the vocal's too bright. And I could, right. and and a lot of times it's easily controlled with the DSer, and there's no sense in having the whole world go back and do a recall mix to do a little EQ tweak. If I can do some DSing and it sounds natural, I'll just do it. Okay, cool, cool. And there's you know hardware DSers that are great. Sometimes they're sometimes they're not working on S's. Sometimes there's one symbol or one crash that's just constantly out of hand, or an overdub, or you know whatever. Sometimes you can just use a DSer with just a different center frequency to just sit on that one little thing and just smooth the whole thing out. Interesting. All right. Um, how about stuff like dynamic EQ? Is that the sort of thing that comes into play in mastering now? Uh, it does for some people, probably. I occasionally use a little multiband compression if I need to sit on a region of a song, but that's not really multiband or, sorry, dynamic EQ. I mean, I guess you could kind of could say it's the same as a multiband compressor. You could just turn up the band in the compressor. So I guess that's dynamic EQ. But as a specific tool for a job, that's not something I get into a whole lot. Yeah. Mostly I'm looking to, if I need to beef something up, I do it with an EQ. And if I need to dial something back dynamically, it's going to be with the DSer or like a band of a multiband compressor. Right. Okay, cool. So um, let's say you get a mix and the kick and bass balance seem off to you. Is that, is that the kind of thing where you might use the band of a multi-band to kind of compress them together a little bit more somehow? Yeah. If the, it's, you can do that if the kick's too loud, if the kick's not loud enough and the bass is too loud, you kind of need to just probably 
get a mixed revision. Okay. That's interesting. Because, you know, if you, if you set a dynamic processor of some kind to kick the kick drum up, I mean, unless you sidechain from a different frequency of the kick drum, meaning having 100 hertz tell it to turn up 50 hertz when it hits. But if, you, if you're in this situation, you probably don't have that. So you can sit a kick drum down into the bass, but it's pretty hard to pull it up because someplace the bass is going to be playing that same frequency. Right. Unless there's just no low end in the bass, but then it's not a problem. You can just dial up the low end in the kick drum. Um, do you feel like you can talk a little bit about what some of the frequency ranges are or typically are for a kick drum and for a bass guitar? Just in case we're trying to wrap our heads around, like, well, what frequencies do those instruments really live in? Okay, well, the, the kick drum kind of has the, like, the 40, 50, 60 hertz, like, the fun room-shaking thump. And then in the 80 to 110 hertz department, it's kind of where the chest impact happens. And then there's kind of a little empty spot up there until you get to where the click is, where, like, the, the snappy impulse of it, which is in the... 1k and up depending on how the drum is eq'd so a bass guitar is going to be anywhere between you know probably for i don't know what the lowest frequency number is but you know 35 or 40 hertz for the very very low stuff all the way up to how much high end do you want to crank into your bass tone but in the course of a song it's going to be all over the place for the bass right. guitar following the notes but it's going to be one place for the kick drum so you might be able to find like one little frequency where the kick drum is allowed to speak around the bass notes if none of the bass notes hit that frequency. Yeah. That's another interactive mess of maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. Yeah. Well, you know, I find that when I'm thinking about production and mixing too, I'm often having to ask myself the question, you know, is the low end of this song, is it the kick drum beat that is driving the song and or is it the bass and the sustain of the bass note have you do you feel like you've come to terms with different production styles and when in one case i mean i think one of the first places i noticed this was when i started really paying attention to hip-hop production um you know and and edm and things like that and discovering that uh that it was all about a kick drum mm -hmm. and there might not even be a bass guitar, you know, it might be something that comes in or be chorus some big or roaring synth bass that comes yeah, exactly. and shakes the earth. And so that production is all about the feel that you get in the song from the kick drum. Mm -hmm. um, but have you also like totally like realized that there are some songs where the, the feel of the song is all about the bass guitar and the kick drum is just sort of like supportive behind the bass. I've also heard other people talk about, when you're mixing low end, you really have to decide like who gets the low end. Is it the kick or is it the bass? And in what ranges, which I feel like is what you were just saying. Mm -hmm. But maybe just comment more about like, you know, what it means to choose one or the other, or maybe I'm thinking about it too hard. Well, you're, I think you're probably thinking about it like a music producer. And I'm thinking about it as a guy who wants to hear low end sound cool. I love, I love, love, love kick drums. I think they're the coolest sound there is. So I always want to hear a beefy, punchy kick drum. Yeah. Although it's not always appropriate. And when it's not appropriate, what comes in usually isn't a beefy, punchy kick drum. Um, but one, one good example of that is the El Macho stuff that I sent. Yeah. Um, some of the dialing in of that, it was the bass having the important part of the tone. And for one of the songs I had like, you know, goose that fun subby stuff a little more than uh, than was probably right. And feedback was like, can you just move the, the center of that kick EQ just a little bit so it's a little less uh, deep thump and a little bit more punch? And I moved it like 15 or 20 hertz. I'm like, oh, yeah, that is that makes perfect sense. And that was one of those like learning as a go things where it's like you can just change the entire character of the whole thing by going from something that's a little less subby to a little more earthy and organic. Yeah. Just in the teeny tiniest little EQ tweak. Yeah. That's fascinating. I guess I'll be a, that's one of those things that is going to be a conundrum for a lifetime of making records. And it's also like really cool that we get to keep figuring out for a lifetime of mm -hmm. making records, you know? Yeah. All right. So let's uh, take it all the way up to the top end and, um, Let's see, where, where was my question on there? Uh, there we go. 
So Cody Jinx, that was another artist that you shared, and it's some great sounding country music. Mm -hmm. You know, we were in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, the working on shiny country music bright. from Texas. Yeah. Oh, they, these guys are from Texas. <laughs> yeah, right? he's from okay, Texas. Cool. Uh, but I wondered if you could talk about getting the brightness balance in a mix when you've got like the acoustic guitars, the cymbals, and the vocals. And what insights do you want to just share about you know the balance of all those things? Like in that record, you know the the brightness is those instruments to my ear. You know. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, those came in like that. You know, I didn't make any drastic changes to much of anything. But, you know, there's a, if I recall on that, there's a, like a little bit of a really wide high-end Pultec type, you know, 20K sparkly thing. And probably a kind of a wide 8K overall presence boost going on. So that probably got the cymbals and the acoustic. And then the vocal has a little, a little treatment, a little bump going on in the, you know, high 1Ks, low 2Ks, probably not up to 2K, but kind of just follow that around until the vocal like speaks just right. Yeah. And the vocal isn't bright, but the presence that's there kind of makes it sound like it. And then a little bit of what the other stuff got helps the vocal with that a little bit. Vocal's kind of important. Yeah, it's a big deal. <laughs> so dialing around to find that little EQ spot to make that speak and sit in the right place without being too far out front and or honky sounding or dull is, is quite a balancing act. And it's easy to, you know, I keep my levels not real loud, but you know, enough to, to hear it. I've got two listening positions. One sits, you know, between 88 and 90 DB and the other one's probably about 75 or 80. And okay. it's like 12 on my Avocet or 24 on my Avocet. And it's just, I have the dim set. So it's like always one or the other. And when it, feels good and it's not harsh and and it, and if we want a bright sound i mean cody's stuff is kind of i'd say medium bright it's got its bright moments but it's not a particularly super shiny record and you know you just find the vibe and dial it around but i mean also those mixes were great right so they came in sounding like a champ but i like the way you're describing thinking about it where your brightness is not just about like should this be bright? Should it not be bright? It's about looking for what these moves do to certain instruments in the mix, mm -hmm. you know, especially the vocals. Um, so I have two questions for you for, about that. <clears throat> One is, why is it important to have these um, sort of steady mixing uh, listening levels and not just be listening at all kinds of different levels? And uh, two is, or the second part of that question uh, Wessel Old Heaton was just on the podcast and he talked about, or he has this book out now. Um, he's talking about how listening at levels, our ear becomes actually adjusted to it. And sometimes we have to listen. I think his idea was that you, you listen at that level consistently for a little while before your ear acclimates to it and you begin to hear it in that kind of way. I just wonder if you want to talk about you know, the importance of listening levels, you know, the 88, well, 90, and the 75. Yeah. and well, hear, Hearing, the frequency response of human hearing varies depending on volume. So the louder you go, the closer to quote-unquote flat your hearing becomes. So you crank it up, you, you actually hear more bass in relation to the other stuff at a louder level. So you turn it down, it kind of feels like you lose a little bit more bass. And my, my 90 decibel spot is one where I've found where I like what my room sounds like blow into high end balance wise there. Uh, I can do it for the better portion of a day without damaging my ears because it's not like eight hours solid of right. that. It's stop, right. let the dog out, you know, make lunch, take a phone call, whatever. There's breaks in the day all over the place, which is also important because your ears can get fatigued. So if you sit there at the same volume level and any louder than that, the muscles in your ears will start to tighten up and that changes how you hear everything. Your low end is going to feel different if your ears are burned. And there have been occasions where I've worked on records and, it, and I've gotten out of this habit, but like getting frustrated because a record isn't coming to where I want it. And I look over and I've got a little, I've got an, an old iPhone with a sound meter on my desk. Nice. And, you know, it's not certified by anybody but i know where the target is yeah, yeah totally. and i look over it's like 112 like, well no no kidding this sounds terrible i've cooked my ears 
out for a half an hour. Yeah. And then I'll come back and push play. I'm like, oh, well, that actually sounds pretty good. Yeah. Like that was me that screwed up. It wasn't the master or the song. I will have totally experienced, you know, both the physical ear reset and the brain reset of yeah. coming back and listening to it oh, tomorrow. Perspective is everything. And I can walk in and be like, oh my God, this is so obvious what I need to do right now. You know? Yeah. There's so many times where I'll do a, a 15 song record and it's a pretty long day and I'm just going to sleep on it. You know, I'm done. I'm really happy with what it is. And I come back in the morning and I maybe make a little tweak here and there on something, but it's always worth coming back and having very fresh ears and uh, and a a new perspective, especially it's one of the great things in mastering. If you're mixing a record and the bass player is a dick and he's made everybody mad and the bass is too low, like the guy who wasn't there when the bass player was a dick is like, well, this needs some more bass. What are they doing? And then dial it up. So you get a little bit of a objective input to it I digress I like, the, the I like other, the story though yeah the other thing with the lower is you know people don't listen to music at 90 decibels all the time right so you want to hear what it's going to sound just like just us right yeah in the car with the giant subwoofer oh 90 is a cute number in my car <laughs> um, <laughs> um so yeah you have a, a little bit more of a, a regular regular vibe and my, my house is not sealed there's a little bit of car noise i'm not recording acoustics so a little bit of noise who cares so hearing regular life mixed in with it can I, am i losing that vocal is there still low end right. there that i can still hear and you know you just get a different perspective there and that i'd like to do that a lot after a phone call or stop in to reduce to reduce return some emails right and you reduce know, some emails yeah. I think that's how we mostly feel about yeah. it yeah right? you know let the let the brain reset and uh i'll I'll let it, I'll just go sit on the couch and let it spin at 75 dB and pet a dog and talk to my wife and just see if anything jumps out. You know, that's the oldest trick in the book. All right. So the other part of the question I wanted to ask was about, you mentioned widening or you mentioned wide, how something about the mix being wide at some point. It just reminded me to ask you about how useful is widening knobs. So mid side where you're, where you're boosting the side image or bringing down the mid in the mastering process. And, um, you know, any comments about the usefulness of widening? Uh, again, it varies against everything. Sometimes uh, I was listening to Jamie Tate's podcast a while back, and he talked about having his NS10s off to the side, basically like a mono-ish yeah, thing totally. over there. And it helps him bring his sides up. I thought, well, if I was mixing, I would do that. That's a really good idea. And, you know, he and he adjusts things based on that. And I will occasionally do a little bit of, you know, side adjustment. Sometimes, sometimes the guitars are all just too loud. And if the mix is such where it's guitars and cymbals on the sides and it's bass vocals and drums in the middle, you can do a lot of adjustment that way. But I, I try not to, to mess with that too much unless I'm really trying to fix something. Right. So it's not an automatic like, no. ooh, let's make this sound cool because it's wide because it just sounds bigger somehow. Well, most of the time those don't do a better job than nothing. I mean, just turning turning the sides up changes the balance. It's not the mix they sent anymore. Right. And I assume that when somebody sends me a mix, they're like, yeah, man, this is awesome. I like it this way. So I'm not going to change it, those balances too much unless there's a conversation. Or, I mean, sometimes beginners don't know what they don't know. And it's like, okay, well, these guys just need some more of that. Right. But it's not a matter of course to start messing with people's side levels. Could you see um, widening in terms of you know using uh, bringing up the side levels in the as part of the mixing process being useful, or is that just fooling ourselves? Because if we widen it a little bit and then start mixing into that, are we just making the same balance decisions that we would have made anyway if we hadn't widened it? Yeah, just turn them up in the mix. I mean, unless you're using some sort of a phase-related psychoacoustic widener doohickey. Right. And but if it's just are, a mid-side thing, that it's no different than simply just... And just turn the things on the sides up. Ah, that's fascinating. Yeah, I guess that makes <laughs> sense. All right. And I'm, I'm, man, I'm improving my mix flow right here on this interview. Big time. All right, so uh, let me ask you about EDM and hip-hop a little bit more. Um, do you master hip-hop and EDM sometimes? A little bit. Not All as right. much as I used to, but I still do. All right, so when you do that... Um, how do things change as far as having lots of bass in a final master? Does that actually mean lower mastering levels in order to have room for bass or low end? Are there any comments about what that means? Well, it, it depends 
again, it depends on everything. Um, I've got one guy who, uh, who has got scads and scads of beautiful, deep, nearly constant, like roaring low end. Hey, Petity, if you're listening, you're that guy. Um, and it's beautiful. And the levels on meters just go through the roof because it's a constant tone or near constant tone of bass. It doesn't sound that loud, but it's a, it's a constant signal. So meter ballistics just pick up on it and sit there. Yeah. So sometimes those those may end up reading louder than they sound because it could be that the track is a kick drum, uh, a synth bass, or a guitar bass, probably a synth bass of some kind, and then like a little sample, a couple of snaps, a snare, and vocals. So you've got the low end over there parked with this huge level, and you got to make sure you get all the other stuff loud enough to compare so that when you set the volume right, the bass is great, and you still have the vocals. Right. So those may show on my meters higher than a rock record, but the rock record has its frequency content in guitars and more vocals and keys or whatever else. So they're going to measure differently, and they're going to sound a little louder with a lower meter level, probably. Because it's more mid-range information, basically, yeah. right? and your ears are more sensitive there. Right. The mid-range is the one frequency that is closest to the same no matter what our listening level is. Yeah, like that 2K baby cry uh primal looking out for the elephant thing, not that elephants make that noise, but baby know, elephants. Yeah, that's the thing <laughs> where people's main radar is for, you know, evolutionarily speaking. Yeah. I can't believe I got that out. Um, you know, but that's where the sensitivity is, so everything from there fades off. What was the word I came up with earlier? Tubulangular or something like that? No, but that one's even better. Yeah. All right. So, <laughs> um, groovy. Um, I feel like when the balance is right, if I'm in the car and I'm and I'm like cranking it up, I f- I think that my ear wants to crank it up to a point where I'm like I register the mid range as being enough, mm-hmm. and when it hits that point, that's when I hope that. The bass is balanced against that, and mm-hmm. the treble is balanced against that, yep. and that's probably like when I've got them all right. Yeah, and because otherwise then, I'll I'll want to keep cranking it up, and then it's too much bass, or you know, or whatever, or I yeah. can't crank it up. Yeah, if you have that that mid range point at the spot where it's comfortable, you have to have the surrounding stuff at the right spot. Otherwise, it's just a pointy mid rangey record. Right, and if that's not loud enough, you end up with a dull or overly bright record, or you know, the smiley face scoop that everybody talks about. Right. You know, everything has to have just its right spot. And uh, a case where communication and that balance comes in, I had a, well, that's an answer for one of your later questions. That's right. We're about to jump into them. Okay. Uh, So, so later, later questions that I'm about to ask right now, um, sort of jam session questions. We'll start at the top, but we can kind of leap through a couple of these. When you started out in recording, what do you feel like was holding you back? Uh, my own uh, lack of going out and talking to strangers. Like I was, I was good in school. I had a vehicle to talk to people. When I got out, I was quiet. When I started mastering, I had a lot of built-in people who knew me from the circles I ran in. Uh, in studios. So I had some built-in client opportunities there and I worked on those, but I didn't get out and talk to people, get to know people, go to shows. Like my, I think my biggest failure professionally is not networking enough. And my, my wife did a really good job. She was, when she was a personal trainer, she went to a lot of networking things and I saw how that worked and I went, oh my God, all my professors in school were so right. I was such a dumbass. And where my studio was at the time was super inexpensive. I didn't really have to hustle that hard. The work I was doing was great. I had enough, but it wasn't enough to like go out and get it. So I think I probably kind of rationalized to myself, like, oh, I'm woodshedding back here, you know. There'll be a time when I'm like ready to go out and and then I guess there was and I did. So now I hard to get to shut up. But there was, you know. 10 years where I was like, man, I, I could have done more if I'd have gotten out and just been around and available and chatty. All right, dig it. So let's jump forward to um, the business question. Um, what advice do you have for the rock stars uh, or what resource do you want to share? You know, maybe with regards to what you just talked about, about getting out there, but for the business end of, 
of doing this if you want to do this for more than just a hobby? Um, well, aside from getting clients is if you want to do this for more than just a hobby, you have to get money from them. And one of my other big problems was, was getting the record done, sending it out, starting the next record, and I'll send that invoice later. And I would find myself months behind on invoices early on, sometimes more than that. And I'm like, now do I send an invoice six months later? That was stupid. So I switched. I mean, everybody, some days you work for love, some days you work for money. Hopefully you get to do both most of the time. And, you know, I do do both here and there. So sometimes you give stuff away because you love to, but most of the time you need to get paid. And having my invoices in QuickBooks where I finish my refs, I find out what parts they're going to need, send an invoice. When they pay me, they get their masters. That keeps them on point. That keeps me on point. And that has kept me from spending hours upon hours of chasing down people for money. And a couple of years ago, I made an exception to that. And the dude still hasn't paid me. I'm like, damn it. This is why I made this policy. Why do I do this? Yeah. So, you know, stick pretty hard to that. And then somebody occasionally comes, says, man, we've got this record. We've got all the time in the world. We'd really love you to do it. We've got like 35 bucks, not actually 35 bucks. I'm like, yeah, man, if you can 35 million bucks. Yeah. I would, I would, I would do that the same day for them. Um, <laughs> so, you know, sometimes you can just park something and get to it when you can get to it and occasionally do that. But, you know, if you're going to be a professional, you have to act like a professional Yeah, and get paid and people have to be happy to pay you. And hopefully they are. But I find that the more communication you do with people, the better it goes. Yeah. Everything up front, rate, rates up front, you know, nobody gets any surprises on their invoices. You know, I think most mastering guys are working per song right now instead of hourly. And there used to be, sometimes that's a detriment to the mastering guy because when I'm cleaning 398 clicks out of a song and it takes me an extra hour and a half, I'm like, song rate. That was a great idea. Let's and, talk about that for a sec. So that's something that I've heard you and other mastering engineers talk about that is that when a song comes in, we might have sent in a mix and thought it was just fine. But one of the first things you might do is take it right into Isotope and actually go look for all these little high frequency clicks and pops and, and clean them up. It's not quite how I do it. Um, my workflow is such that I'm in Sequoia. I play and record out through my analog chain back into another track in Sequoia. And I've got a hot button set up with a little, it's on my question mark. So every time I hear a little noise, I want to go check out, I just, you know, tick that little thing. And, and I do all the mastering, get all the sounds. And then once I've got my, my gaps and fades in and outs, I'll take a break for a minute, come back. And then it's like click time. And if there are clicks, I'll go through and listen where every marker is that I put in. Some songs have so many that I'll just skip those and just start at the top of the song and listen all the way down. Yeah. And a lot of times little teeny tiny lip smacks or uh, unfaded edits, fade your edits, everybody fade your edits, always fade your edits. Right, right. Fade your edits. Um, Did you get that, Rockstars? Fade everybody, your edits. Fade your edits. Um, so sometimes when mastering is done, those little things pop up. And if it's a dull mix and the high end of an impulse is brought up, you just hear it more now. Right. So it's not necessarily that anybody did a bad job. Sometimes little things just show up. Sometimes it just got it's, revealed. Yeah. Sometimes it, it could be a, a little processor glitch and an export. It could be an edit. It can be mouth noise. It can be anything. I don't care if it sounds bad. I just want to take it out. Right. And there was a song a few months ago, the, like the main word of the chorus, every single one of them had a click in it. Oh man. So I'm like, well, I got to clean all those out. You can't have the fundamental word of this song, have a big old booger in the middle of it. So I had to go through and clean about 60 of those out. Wow. I had a, it was a band I was producing and, we would do a lot of compression on the vocals and all the consonants would yeah. have this sharp attack to them. And I had to go and put like a little fade in at the beginning of every consonant of every, every word in the chorus. Yeah. I'm glad I don't do that so much anymore. I'm there, glad I don't do that. There was a record a couple of weeks ago where like that, like really hard was in the same place with a click. And it was one of those, I think it was, I think it was at the end of a D on a song where it could be, very soft, or it could be a D with a hard consonant. And I thought, well, 
the softer ones sound smoother because in this delicate moment, that click doesn't vibe for me. And they're like, did you take out a click at the end of this? I'm like, oh, yeah, sorry. Didn't love that. I'll put it back for you right now. Yeah. And and that's fine. You know, that's funny. it's their record. They get their sounds the way they want it. All right. So um, do you have a recording tip hack or secret sauce for the rock stars? Something they could use on their next session today? Um, you want to share? Communication, really. Make sure that you're talking about the same thing with the people who are giving you feedback. I had a case a couple of years ago where I had the opportunity to do a few songs for a big deal dude. And I got the mixes and like one of them was great. And I loved it a lot. Two of them were a little, not quite where I was. I wanted everything to sound like the first one. So I made them sound like the first one. And the feedback from the producer was like, it sounds too bright. And where do you go when somebody says bright? What frequency do you think of? 8K, 10K, I something probably, high. Yeah, I probably think of like a, yeah, 8, 8K and above. Yeah. So I turned down that high stuff and you're like, oh, it didn't sound too bright for me, but you know, I'll t- dial it down a little bit. It came back, still too bright. Like, well, I'll dial it down a little more. It's like, man, it's just, it's still too bright. And by then I had lost the gig. Right. Because he was talking about 2K. Ah. Which to me wasn't bright. I should have said, okay, what? What in the song are you hearing? What instrument? Right. What vocal? What is the thing that is doing this to you? Because we just didn't have even communication grounds to get to where he wanted to go. Had I gone a little deeper and 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 because I, I didn't know the guy, we didn't have a working relationship where a lot of guys I know what they mean when they say a thing, and I didn't do that. So I went too fast. I didn't uh, clarify the communication, and you know that you know I canned it. Um, and I like how the communication is breaking it down into language that you both understand. Find a word that you both understand. So if it was the pick attack on the acoustic guitar is too aggressive, mm-hmm. then all of a sudden you guys would figure out your own ways to, yeah. you'd know how to listen for that. You'd know how to address it. Yeah. I mean, like the, the vocals poking out a little more than I would like. Right. Would have, would have sent me exactly to the right spot. Yeah. Would have had one tweak. We would have been done and, you know, probably be doing records with that guy. All right, share a favorite hardware tool, something. So this could be something that you are excited about that you want to share with the rock stars that might be super affordable, or it could be something real high end on the other end of the spectrum that you are real, just think sounds amazing. Well, the mastering stuff doesn't really come into the super affordable category terribly often. Um, I think the Rupert Neve Designs Master Bus processor is... It's so much bang for the buck that you could say it's a good deal. It just does so many cool things. And I don't normally use all of the things that it does at once, but it's got adjustable silk, red or blue. Those are awesome. The limiter in it is awesome. The compressor in it, when it's the thing that I want, is awesome. But it's not always the compressor that I want. But their their variable release time limiter thing is just tasty as hell. And plus it's got mid side and depth adjustments so we can use that to fix a little bit of a thing here and there it's really really cool so that's something that would be useful to anybody in the mix stage as well as oh the yeah mastering stage. yeah you could use that on channels you could use it on a drum mix the 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 silk controls what do those they, do as you said red and blue silk yeah the the they emulate sort of some of the older uh neve design circuitry Somebody correct me. I don't know all of the words, but the blue kind of does a low end fattening thing like the old class A stuff. The red kind of does a, a bitey high end presence thing. And can I use both? No, not on <laughs> this, which would be really nice. Um, but, you know, sometimes, you know, the red can just put bite. If the low end is already great, the red can put great bright and bite and brilliance in guitars and vocals. If something's a little bright, you can crank up the blue and it fills up. It's a really long, wide, low end, nice, slopey thing, and it adds some harmonic love to it. And it just makes it like gluey and thick and awesome. You just, you got to not do too much because too much is an option. I love it. And usually when we find some new tool in the studio, the first thing we do is too much. Yeah. Because it's fun. Yeah. And then tell it's not fun anymore. And then we'll back it off and f- figure out how to really use it. Yeah. Anytime you get a new dramatic piece of gear, do your thing with it and walk away and come back for that fresh perspective because you may have dialed in too much of it. 
Um, what was the the BBE Sonic Maximizer? Is that what it was? The yeah. thing that like back in the eighties, yeah. nineties, or whatever. This was this was nineties, wasn't it? Yeah, there was that. And there was also the uh, Apex RL Exciter. Oh, that's what I'm thinking about. Yeah, oh, the yeah. RL Exciter. Sorry, yeah. Dude, those things are great on a, on a bus. Just bring it up for a little sizzle. Just don't stick a whole mix through it. That'd be bad. I, I haven't seen. No, do we have we have um we have an Exciter plug-in version of that? I think don't we? Yeah, I think we do. I think I have that. Yeah, there's one out there. I think I think it's the, I think it was the Type B that I always liked better than the Type C. But dig it. Yeah, it's been um, like a thousand years. How about a uh, since we're talking about software? How about a favorite software tool or one that you're just excited about? Something you want to hit the rock stars to? <sighs> um, Oak Sound Soothe is remarkably cool. What's it, that all about? It's a high end resonant filter kind of. D, I feel it, 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 I treat it like a deburring tool, you know, like for metal work. Like it just, it can kind of just take the louder edges off of things, but it's got such great, it's it's like a, a, a billion band de-esser. Okay. With, with, it's got a adjustable side chain, so you can tell it to work harder in this area than in that area, or you can filter it out so it's only doing the really high stuff or really SE stuff, but for me if if i need to just like mellow the high end on the loud parts it's a great thing to dial that in because if the chorus and or no i'm sorry if the verse and the bridge and the intro all have nice sparkle but there's just too much crap comes in in the chorus and it's and it's too bright it just sits on it and darkens it a little bit without if you set it right without taking the snap of the yeah. of the snare away and stuff but that's great and um that i feel like is one of the reasons why I reach for multiband, mm-hmm. you know, is that yeah, this is like a billion too, band processor, too harsh or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And you can you can adjust it so that it does like wide Q dips or really 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 narrow notchy things, but it'll do all of the notches on a sound and not just like a single band deesser. You know, I use DMG essence for that when I want to just grab one thing. Mm-hmm. But if Everything needs a little bit of it. Just a little bit of soothe. Just kind of mellows it all out. All right, dig it. I love it. Um, then how about an organizational resource? You know, we were just talking about rescuing my hard drive with Time Machine. Um, that's specifically backup. But, I mean, anything about just keeping your shit organized in the studio that you want to share with the Rockstars? Um, yeah, in mastering, I can go through, you know, depending multiple projects in a day. And somebody might need these three songs done and this tweak and then these masters. And I just write it on paper. Right. You know, I used to try to keep everything on a computer and then I'm on a PC and I use Thunderbird, but my phone's an Apple and I couldn't, it just was banging my head against the wall to get the calendars to sync. I'm like, screw it. Notepad on the side of the desk. Everything I have to do, put a mark through it when I'm done. If something needs like top priority, put a little starry thing next to it. And I'm totally old school, like my mom with her calendar on her desk in the kitchen. I'm totally with you on that. I got a little notepad right here. I'm trying to, but I'm trying to write down notes when we're doing this, yeah. but I've actually had one of the rock stars tell me that they could hear my pencil going during the interview <laughs> too. So I'm trying to do it. just tells you that's something to pay attention to. Yeah. So uh, I, again, it was Jim Domain when I was in a studio with him and he would have like a legal pad and a pen, of pa- you know, piece of, a pencil mm-hmm. and a piece of paper there. And I was like, man, that's seems pretty organized, you know, and it was uncluttered too. And, um, and I started doing that, especially in the studio. If I'm, when I'm listening, an idea pops in, I'm like, Oh, I need to remember that, but it's going to be gone so fast. Cause I'm listening again. It down. So I just like write it down as fast as I can. Cause, and then I can forget about it. Mm-hmm. I know I'll come back to it. Um, I find that really helpful if I'm, if we're doing tracking and we're doing a take on something and I need to remember that before we do the next take, yeah. bring the you know hi-hat level down, bring this kick drum level up and the snare level down or whatever. Um, that's a great way for me to remember that. In mi- mixing, it's really helpful to me to just try and have shorthand for taking notes during a listen to the whole mix so that you can do one listen through, mm-hmm. make your notes on it, and then go back and just address those things. You know. Yeah, I'm kind of schizophrenic in my style doing that. Once I get an album done, I'm doing like needle drops all over the place. And if I have a little, like one of my little markers for a thing to check, like I'll go, 
Like if there's like, do I want to see if that vocal distortion is that in the mix? Is that me? I'll do like do 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 and do like ten little markers across it and see that there's a streak that I need to check because it's not a click. And uh, like that's that's kind of my my in progress thing like that. But I never have musicians sitting there that I need to save a vibe for. I can push right. start and stop all I want. Yeah, I just do that anyway. Screw the musicians. Yeah. What are they? <laughs> Sorry, musicians. Um, all right, so then um, let's let's just take it to the end here. Close it out. We're gonna take the Wayback Studio mach- machine and go back in time. Find young Dan, um, who is uh, about to blow up the Serwin Vega speaker, and you say, "Hey, before you blow that thing up, I've come to give you this one bit of advice. Here's the single most important thing you need to know to be a rock star of the studio yourself one day." And it begins with not blowing up that speaker. Or maybe it begins with blowing up the speaker. I hey, don't man, know. lessons are learned with dollar signs often. Um, that's not the lesson. Well, that's a lesson. That's not the lesson. It is a good one. Um, uh, talk to people. People want friends. And this whole, the whole music community is about friends and having good times. So uh, in school, I was all studio, not much social. If I wasn't at school, I was listening to music at home on speakers somewhere, not social. So I think making your community uh, an important part of your career is important. Because now that I'm out chatting with people, like I know all these great people that I go out and see and we go to places and it's, you know, like old friends hanging out. And for the longest time, it was, you know, me feeling like, oh, I don't know these guys. I don't know if I want to talk to them or if they want to talk to me. Like, just go start talking to strangers. And if they're jerks, they'll tell you to piss off. Right. And if they're cool, they're cool. So be cool. Well, we just got through Summer Nam, and, you know, we got to go to some events at that. And it's it's it re- does require some energy to go to those and mm-hmm. to talk to everybody. But the feeling is always so great. It's like, it's such a good feeling to see all these other people that are doing, you know, coming out of their closets, just like you are, mm-hmm. uh, just like I am, you know, and, and chat with everybody and meet everybody. And I think that's great advice. Yeah. I mean, I rolled my own business. I didn't go work for a mastering house anywhere. I didn't have a mastering mentor. I like, I have to make a red book CD. How do I do that? Google and figured out what did that. And I, you know, kind of reverse engineered my whole situation and which was great because I've got the way that I do it. I don't really know how that many other guys do it. And I didn't have, you know, a mastering environment to, to have any practice in, which got me to be in the guy in the chair sooner because I've just bought a chair. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, there's something to being a part of a community and immersing yourself in what it is that you want to do and getting to know the people that do that in different ways to do it. And to see what works best for you. Yeah, I feel like I learn a ton just by talking to other people about how they make records. Yeah, I listen to mixers on your podcast, and I've learned stuff. Dig it. Well, now we're all listening to you, dude. Thanks for joining us on the show. You're welcome. Um, Let the rock stars know how they can find out more about you. How do they go check out your mastering studio? Which, uh, sorry, I was looking for the name here. It is Master and Tone, right? Tone and Volume Mastering. Tone and Volume Mastering. Sorry about that. Toneandvolume.com. My Instagram and Twitter and Facebook are all Dan Shike. Uh, if you see a Dan with cows, that's the other Dan Shike, not <laughs> me. A Dan with cows? Yeah, there's a there's a, a bovine specialist guy mm. in Iowa or something with my name. I think we're related. Um, well, again, thanks for being on the show with us, dude. It's absolute pleasure to hang out with you. It's been fun. Um, there's been a fly buzzing around over our head, so I don't know yeah. whether you guys will hear them. Or I hope podcasting. everybody's really annoyed by it. I hope so. <laughs> um, we'll see you around the studio, dude. Thanks, Thanks for joining us. Totally. All right, cheers. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, please leave a rating and review on iTunes to help reach more people. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to recordingstudiorockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And if you want more free content, all you have to do is text RS Rockstars to 33444. Again, that's RS Rockstars to 33444. And I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, and podcast updates. And I'll let you know about any upcoming giveaway offers, all totally free. Thanks for listening. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music. Music.